All right, so we're going to get started. I have no idea where like half of you are, but such is life. Um, hey, yeah, yeah, maybe they're off by an hour. Um, so the, the first thing that I wanted to pull up, you guys that are here got your grade sheet. Um, and I like to kind of walk through it for those of you that have not seen one of my grade sheets before because there's a lot of stuff on them. Um, and I try to do this so that you have every piece of information you can possibly have uh, about what's going on. So the, the summary, the current grade, the, the part that's in the gray box uh, is probably the part that everybody really cares about. So you will see your name there and you'll see your grade and your percentage right there. The top row is always the class average, the bottom row is always you on all of these things. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind uh, as you're looking at it. Um, a couple things to point out. Um, if your grade is not where you want it to be, there's a pretty good chance it has something to do with your comment section right now. The comments are worth a skewed amount because the, at the end of the semester they're worth 5% of your grade. Right now, that 5% is about the same as your first assignment that's graded. So if you didn't do any of your comments and you have a zero there, it kind of unfairly drags you down. So it's going to change a lot. You can make up for comments. So if you are missing some, it's okay. Just, just add some more to it. Um, looks like the total number I was looking for as of um, Wednesday, last Wednesday, was 28. So you should have about 28 comments. Uh, you'll see how many comments you have and what percentage. If you have more than 28 comments, let's say you had 30 comments or 32 comments, the grade sheet caps it at 28 and gives you 100%. That doesn't mean that those don't count toward future comments. So if you're ahead, you'll stay ahead, uh, which, is, which is absolutely fine. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, sometimes right here at the end of the, the grade sheet, so in this case, we're going, uh, this, this person's turned in all of their exercises as they've gone across, except for 111. That one hasn't been turned in yet. Chances are you just didn't post it, or you post it after I went through and, and graded your work. Does that make sense? So it's not something to panic about. If you're missing one at the very end here, and you can actually see the percentage of ones that have turned in, it's only at 64%. So chances are it just people hadn't posted it when I went through and did the grading. So it's not the end of the world. To, to worry about that. I'll catch it the next time through. Uh, and it, sometimes I end up missing a few and you'll say, hey, I turned this one in and I'll say, hey, show it to me and I'll just do it right there uh, or I'll look it up. Um, sometimes I miss them. Usually I'm pretty, pretty on top of it, but that's part of why I give you all this information so you can audit me and say, hey, you missed this one or you missed that one, uh, et cetera. There's a lot of things to keep track of. Um, in, the, in the big box down here at the bottom, um, you'll have your assignment grades as they're assigned. So obviously if there's zeros right now, and I haven't graded it yet, so uh, 102 I haven't graded yet. I figured I'd get this out to you, and then I'll work on 102 and try to get you another one um, out later this week. So uh, 101's been graded. You'll get your grade in the box next to it, and then there's some generic comments that have to do with kind of where you fall and, and what kinds of things might have gone wrong. If you feel like you want to sit down and understand exactly why you got a 92 or an 88 or whatever, let me know and we'll sit down and I'll talk you through um, where that falls. Uh, let's see. Exercises are from the bar above. Comments from the comment section. Participation, this is if you're missing class or if you're late to class, that grade goes down. The only way to improve that grade is to be here and show up and et cetera. Make sense? At the very top, it says you've missed how many days of class, you've notified me of this many classes that you've been gone, uh, and you've been late this many times. So in this case, this student hasn't been late or anything, so we're, we're good on this. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Should be fairly self-explanatory, yeah? But it's at least worth kind of talking through so that you guys uh, know what it looks like. So there we go. That is your grade sheet in a nutshell. Uh, today we're going to talk about portfolios, which I actually think is kind of a fun one. You'll notice that, yes, you did get assignment 107. No, I'm not completely off my rocker. It is assignment 107, and it is due at the very end of the semester. So you get it today, and the presumption being that you start working on it today, and you will continue working on it a little bit in the background from here until the very end of the semester. If you ignore this completely, and you try to do this in the last couple days of the semester, it won't turn out well. I'll just tell you that right now. Portfolios take time to mature. You have to kind of play through them. You have to try different examples. You have to change things. And eventually, you'll get to the right good portfolio. 
So it takes time. That's part of why you're getting it today and part of why we're starting on it and talking about it. So a couple notes about it. As a reminder, it is worth 30% of your overall grade for the class. That's a lot. That means that if you do a bad job on it at the end of the semester, it can actually drag your grade down. It also means that if you do a really good job on it, you might drag your grade up. So it is worth something is the, the important part about it. It is due at 9.30 on Monday, May 18th, which seems like forever from now, but it's really not. It'll be here before you blink. Um, so it is due on Monday. That is that kind of quasi-finals week where nobody can agree on when their final exams are going to be. Um, so I just put it on the first day to get it over with. Um, the, pr the idea here is that you, you'll have it done, you'll turn it in, and then you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, there are a couple notes about that week, though. Because it's a regular week, not a finals week, uh, it's mandatory that we have class both days. I don't make the rules. So what I do is everything's due on uh, that Monday. I'll bring donuts that Monday. I always bring donuts. It's like five dozen donuts. It's pretty entertaining. Um, I will bring donuts that day. I'll give you guys a, a little survey to fill out about what you liked, what you didn't like. If you think I should switch and put the InDesign section first instead of the Photoshop section, you guys give me that feedback. Hopefully, I, I take it and modify the class a little bit. You've been surprised how much I've modified the class, though nobody has been able to give me a replacement for Charlie Harper yet. I'm still working on that. So it might happen. You never know. Um, we'll do all of that on Monday. So we have class as normal on Monday. Then on Wednesday, because we're technically supposed to have class, you have to come in here and you have to check in with me. I'll have a little sheet that you sign saying, I was here, and then you can go study and do whatever you want to do. But <coughs> I have to actually have that class day. I have to be here. You have to show up, et cetera. Make sense? OK. So um, today we're going to start working on your uh, portfolio. I'm going to talk about portfolios, then you're actually going to start working on it. You have two assignments thus far that can go in, your assignment 101 and your assignment 102. So you have some content already to start working with. So that's a good place to begin. I'm trying to think if there's any other things. I don't think so. But if you guys think of questions, you can, of course, ask me. So let's start talking about portfolios today. So what is a portfolio in the first place? I think it's a good question. It's something to think about because a portfolio is something that in the design fields, in the fields like architecture or industrial design or graphic design, uh, we have this thing called a portfolio that becomes so important. And I'm sure you've heard, oh, you've got to have a portfolio. You've got to have that. Turn in your portfolio. Do this. Well, what is that portfolio in the first place? Well, the, the easy answer is, well, it's a bunch of your work. And you just put it in there and you know people can see what you did. But it's more than that. You as a designer are unique. You have a different set of skills. You have a different set of interests than the person sitting next to you. Your portfolio should reflect that different set of skills, that different set of interests. It should be the story of you, the designer. And if you think of the portfolio not as, hey, here's all the work I've ever done in my life, but instead, this is who I am, and this is what I'm interested in, in showing you, and this is what I'm interested in working on, that's really what a portfolio is about. And so if you walk into a firm, so you want to go to work for a firm, and you hand them your portfolio, you want them to say, wow, this person's really interested in whatever it is, and I want, they would be really beneficial in this firm. Like, I want them to be part of this. That's what the portfolio is about. It's not really about, oh, yeah, this person really knows Photoshop, or this person really knows Rhino, or whatever. It's not really about that. That's the bonus. It's about who you are as a designer. That's what you want to be seeing. Make sure you tell that story of you as the designer and make sure you emphasize what makes you different and unique. Because all of you have different backgrounds, all of you have different interests. What is it that makes you you as a designer? That's a really important thing to kind of think about. So the other, the next piece, and this is something that we'll start working on today as well, is to have some kind of an introductory page. So we open that portfolio. What's the first page we see? It's some kind of an introduction to, hey, this is what's going to be in the book. It's a table of contents, so to speak. It identifies who you are as the designer. It identifies what the projects are going to be in the portfolio, so we know what to be looking for. And it might contain some additional information about yourself. So it probably should have your name. And if you want to put some other stuff, that's OK. I've seen it where they build the resume into the very beginning, too. And I have an example where you'll see that. 
uh, today. It's not required, but it's certainly something to be uh, thinking about. The other thing about a portfolio, it is very much a current document. It's an evolving document. It should always be changing, and it should be about who you are at the given moment. What's your best project to date? That should be in the portfolio. If a project's more than, say, three or five years old, it's like ancient history. Now, this changes a little bit when you get out in the real world and you, you're practicing architect or you're doing projects, because sometimes projects take a long time. So you might, a good example would be my own personal project. Um, let's see, I designed it um, you know, three years ago, four years ago, whatever, five years ago. Uh, then we built it for 26 months. Well, it's still kind of relevant because I just finished it. I've been working on that one project for that long. So even though it's an older project, I would still put it in my portfolio. But you guys as students, right, you do new projects several times a semester. At least once a semester you have new work. All that should be in your portfolio and it should be evolving because chances are the project that you just did is better than the one that you did the semester before, which is better than the one that you did the semester before that. So as it evolves, that's what you want in your portfolio. So it needs to be updated at least every semester. So you should get to the end of the semester, you say, oh, I should add a few more pages to my portfolio. And if you set it up right in InDesign, it's pretty easy to do it. Furthermore, you can chop off some of the pages that aren't so good, like the ones from this class, for example. I'm not under that delusion that you're going to keep those in there forever. Know what the purpose of each project is in your portfolio. So this is another big concept idea, and that's not, man, this is just a great project, I want to show it. It's, why is this a good project? What is it showing about me as a designer? How does that improve selling me? So for example, if you're really good at 3D renderings, that's great. But if you always show 3D renderings, you're limited to, oh, this person can clearly do 3D renderings, but I don't know what else they can do. So you want to show some diversity. I think a good example of this, I had a student, this is a long time ago. This is uh, probably 2008, 2009, something like that. And uh, I had two students. They were both in my class. Uh, they graduated from here. They went to Berkeley. And in the first day of their um, 100-day studio, and I think they've changed this a little bit, but back then, in the first day of your 100-day studio, the, the person who was in charge of the studio would say, okay, show me your portfolio. And that determined where you got placed in the various studio groups. So in a Berkeley studio, sorry, i got to give you more background. You might have 80 or 100 people in the studio, and then you're broken into groups of like 10, and you have one person in charge of those 10 people. But deciding on which person you get broken into was based on your portfolio. And it might not be anymore, because they've evolved the, the program a little bit. But in this scenario, I had two students. Both were great students. They graduated here. They went to Berkeley. And they got the, to that first day. And they said, let me see your portfolio. One of the students had a prepared portfolio that was about what he was interested in. It had a bunch of rendering stuff in it and, and whatever. It was about what he was interested in. He showed that portfolio, and he got placed with the person who wanted to do the renderings and kind of push the design boundaries and, and whatever. The second student wasn't prepared, and all he had with him at the time were a bunch of hand drawings. So he showed the hand drawings, because that's what he had. Well, guess what? He got placed in the studio that did everything by hand even though he, that wasn't really what he wanted to do. So when you're picking what's showing in a portfolio, you're really talking about what you're interested in. And if you're showing something that's not what you're interested in, you have to be careful. So it is important, of course, to show what you're interested in, but it's important to show a diversity of, hey, here's some other skills that I have. And I think this might be even more relevant when you're pursuing a job. You want to say, hey, I'm really good at rendering. And maybe they're going to hire you for that. But you want to also say, hey, I'm really good at these other things, too. So I could, I could help you in those other areas, not just in the rendering. That's how you get hired not as just a CAD drafter. You get hired as somebody who's an intern who wants to learn design process, et cetera. OK. This is the tricky one. Who did what? Group work. So inevitably, in school, you end up in a group, and you end up doing a design project together. You might have a partner, you might have three, you might have four, depends on the class. I know in, um, in 220, it's always in pairs. So you end up doing your work. So this is challenging because you end up both working on a particular project. And how do you put that group project in your portfolio? Well, number one, you shouldn't hide the fact that it's a group. You shouldn't try to say, hey, this is my project. Well, no, it's not your project. It's a group project. So 
chances are that if you're applying for a scholarship, you're applying for an internship, you're applying for Berkeley, et cetera, your group person, whoever you're with, is probably applying for the same stuff as you. So when their portfolio is shown and your portfolio is shown, they're going to look at it and say, wait a minute, this is the same project. So if you're not owning the fact that it was group work, you can get stuck, and that's a problem. So own that it's group work. Then how do you identify what your contribution is to the group? That's the key here. Is so think about what it is that you did in the group. Now, if you're a total slacker and you didn't do anything, that really sucks for you. So don't be a total slacker. But chances are you focused on some particular aspect of the design or some particular aspect. You were really good at rendering, so you worked on the renderings. You were really good at the modeling, so you worked on the modeling. You built a physical model. I don't know, but you focus your part of the portfolio on the stuff that you did in the group. That's how you identify the group work. Is it okay to show the big group poster boards or whatever? Sure. But just remember to focus in on what your contribution was to the group, uh, and that's really going to help you out. I have an example later on of a student's portfolio um, from here, from DVC, and it has some group work in it. So you'll see how that kind of plays out as we go forward. So a really good portfolio is a well-designed portfolio. It's carefully graphically done, but it's not something where the graphic design takes center stage. And this is one of those weird things. You want to be really good graphically, but you want the graphic design to go away so that you're so focused on the content. So the best graphic design you don't even notice. Great portfolios take time to evolve. That's a really big one. That's part of why I'm giving you the assignment right now, so that it can take the time to evolve. So when I applied to grad school, this is back in like 2004. I know it's ancient history. I'm dating myself. Um, I did seven complete portfolios before I ended up with the one that I turned in for grad school. It took me that many tries to get it right. And I was close. And sometimes you end up not realizing it. Uh, and so I would work on a portfolio, then I'd go see somebody, a mentor or whatever, and say, what do you think? And they'd say, eh, it's not quite there yet. <laughs> and I'd go back and rework it again. Uh, so it was definitely an evolution. Um, and I think it's something that you, you need to kind of work through and chew on. It's not going to be your first one. And you may get to the point where you finish the portfolio this semester, and you turn it in and you get your grade on it, and the next semester you say, you know what, I'm going to redo that. I'm going to have another portfolio. That's OK, too, because it is the kind of thing that takes time to evolve. Understanding the setup of portfolio. So this is a little bit different than the other graphic designs that I was talking about before. Uh, and that is because of a couple things. One, the binding on a portfolio is a little bit challenging. And this is, a, of course, assuming that you're digitally or you're uh, printing it, not just submitting a digital portfolio, a PDF. So if you're printing it, Chances are you're binding it at some kind of a binding shop, like a FedEx, Kinko's, or whatever, something like that. And you're using a spiral or a comb binding. And when you use that kind of binding, and I've got a bunch of examples. I'll dig them out of my office, and I'll put them on the back table today so you can look at them. When you use that kind of binding, you lose space at the very center because of all the holes that are punched in it. And so you can't put really important content right there in the center because you're going to lose it. So in that scenario, setting up the inner margin to be maybe double what the outer margin is, is a better strategy, because otherwise you're losing too much. So give yourself some extra space in the center because of that binding. The other thing is something called bleed. And we're going to set up bleed today. And the idea behind bleed is that when you go to print your document, and I guess this is probably more relevant in a production house. Because when you guys are doing yours, if you go to print it and you need to trim a page or you need to cut it down or whatever, you can do it page by page individually, get it perfect. But if you imagine, say, printing a magazine, you know, big magazine house, they're printing a bunch of, you know, money magazine or, you know, whatever, whatever magazines you read, if you even read them. Hundreds and hundreds of pages are coming out of the printer at a given time. And they're on big sheets and then they get cut down to size. Make sense? Yes? OK. When we go to cut those, it's possible that one of the prints didn't quite get straight. So when you go to cut it, it might not be straight, and you might end up with a weird little white line. If the image was supposed to bleed all the way off the page, if it was cut funny or it was crooked or whatever, you'd end up with these artifacts, and it wouldn't look right. So enter the concept of bleed. 
So the idea behind bleed is that we have about an eighth of an inch that goes around your page. And if we have an image that is supposed to go all the way off the page, we give ourselves that extra eighth of an inch so that when we cut it, we have plenty to work with. So it's not going to be crooked and it's not going to have extra white lines. It's our way of ensuring that we have plenty of color so that the color goes all the way off the edge of the page. So we're going to set this up today and I'm going to walk you through how to do it in InDesign where we have this bleed and we're going to have that eighth of an inch bleeding off the page so that you can then trim it down. Of course, assuming that your images go off the page. If they don't go off the page, it doesn't really matter. But if they are meant to go all the way off the page, then they do matter. Oh, also, we're going to be in CMYK mode. Uh, well, I'll explain color space in, a, in, what is it, three lectures from now, I think. So here's an example setup. We have the eighth of an inch of bleed going around the outside. We have uh, a quasi margin of a quarter of an inch, except for the inner, which is a half inch to accommodate for that spiral binding. And that's our overall layout for a relatively standard portfolio. Now, this is in portrait mode. You might switch to landscape mode, but the, the concept is still very much the same. So let's look at some examples. I'll show more of uh, this person's work a little bit later on. This is a professional. This is Alex Holgreff. Um, Visualizingarchitecture.com is his website. He, is, he was trained. He has a master's degree. I hope I got this right. Uh, he has a master's degree in architecture, was trained as an architect, um, but then decided that he really preferred just doing visualizations. He likes rendering and collage work so much that his firm that he started, all they do is quality renderings. So you as an architect would do your design work, you'd build your SketchUp model or your Rhino model, you'd send it to him, and he'd do these beautiful renderings of it. So that's, that's his job. That's what he does. So he produces these portfolios over time volumes of work that he's worked on. Um, you can look it up on Visualizing Architecture. It's totally worth it, your time to just peruse his website. He's really, really good at what he does. Uh, so this is one of them. This is the cover that he set up. Uh, but let's look at some of the pages inside this. And this is a little bit dated. This is his portfolio from 2014. He does one every year, I think. Um, and some of this is just has filler text in it. But we're going to look at graphically what's happening in this particular portfolio. So like I said, the first page, when you open that book, should be about who you are and what's in the book. So if we look at his page, we have, this is him, so we have his name here, and then we have a table of contents with the projects that are going to be in the book. There's four projects total. And he has kind of a nice little graphic touch here where there's a little graphic that represents each project, so we have an understanding of what those four projects are, and a little tiny explanation of what that project is. Let's jump forward. So this is his first one. So let's pay attention to a few things, and I'm going to flip back and forth among these pages a little bit so that you can see it, but let's look at how he's chosen to lay these things out. So we've got about, we've got one whole page here, then we split this page in two. So if we look at it, this is about three quarters overall, and this is about one quarter. Kind of rule of thirds-ish. Right? So we've got that. I'm going to flip forward a slide here so you can see kind of how it, how it plays page to page. So he's using a similar vocabulary. It's not quite the same spacing with this text space versus the image space. But as we go to the next page, we've got another image, and then we've got about two thirds going that way. So it's not precise, but there's a consistency to the layout. And on the first page, we've got the, the big color saturation as the big splash with the white. On the second page here, it's mostly white detail with the one color, so it's flipping. Another example, this is the next project here. This one, you can start to see the flow line materialize. So there's a flow line that's running across here. Notice, though, that this is broken right at about the same, two-thirds, one-third, or three-quarter, one-quarter. So it's subtle things that are re repeating as you go forward. There's that flow line again, same distance. This is also at about the same break. So you guys see how that every page is, has this similar vocabulary. He's thought a lot about how this is set up such that we have those same visual cues. 
So this one's just a three column setup. And it's actually, um, there's, there's not that third, two thirds break at all. There's again that flow line coming back. There's that break. So you can see there's just this consistency page to page. Aren't these renderings awesome? This is 2014 too. So we're like, this is six years ago he was doing this. So he's, he's just exceptionally good at these renderings. Okay, so let's look at another example. We'll show you, I'll show you some more of his work um, in a, in a few, few more classes. So you'll see, you'll see lots of his work going forward. Um, another architecture portfolio, I have no idea who this student was who this person was. I just picked it out because I thought it was a good portfolio. Um, and it kind of illustrates the same sorts of things that we've been talking about. So here's our first spread. When we first open up that portfolio, what do we see? Well, we need to make sure that we have the name, but he also chose to include some of his resume, which is good. I have one thing to pick on here, and that is this right there. So it's great that you have skills in these software, but don't ever say that I, I just have, you know, really average skill. Like, no, no, that you don't put that. So you either are awesome or you just exclude it. Don't give yourself a rating on how good you are at it, okay? So just say I have skills in Rhino, V-Ray, uh, AutoCAD, Revit, whatever. Don't, don't try to give yourself a bar. So I, I just got to pick on that because, sorry, whoever you are, <laughs> don't do it. Okay. Uh, but then on this side, we have that same kind of table of contents where we have here's the work, kind of a little graphic that represents the project, a little bit of text that describes the project. And then we have the actual pages. Another example here, there's that first page. Now this one has the table of contents, but it doesn't have the name anywhere. I think it should have the name. It belongs, it belongs there. So I think that's, that's a piece that's left out. Probably the reason that he did that, or she, I don't know who this is that did it, uh, is because the following page has kind of the resume on it. Um, so she's added, or he's added an extra page um, kind of going through that. Great graphically, except that if you imagine this a book, where's the book fold? Right here. So if that's folding, then the thing that you design that you spend all that time doing is right in the crack, which is not where you want it. So take that and move it over here. So think about that rule of composition. Don't, don't get sucked into something like this, even though it looks awesome on the overall spread. OK. So this is Bashir's portfolio. He was a student here probably four years ago now, something like that. Um, but I think this is a good example because it's going to show the same kinds of projects that you're seeing. This is an architecture student. Sorry, you guys, but I don't have any good examples of yours yet. Um, so here we go. First page, we've got that introduction. He's calling it an index, not a table of contents. And then he has his own personal introduction with kind of his backstory, et cetera. And then we move into some of his projects. So this is a Mondrian Museum project, same project that you guys would all do. And you can kind of see how he's laid that out. I think it would be helpful if this elevation lined up a little bit more with that so that those two were kind of a flow line running across. So you can always tweak these things just a little bit. I think the flow line across the top is set perfect, right, where they're consistent across. You can see that there's consistency in the intro page. So here's the, the Mondrian Museum. And there's the Calder Museum. Font choice is the same. Sizes are the same. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that have been set up for you. So here's an example of group work. This is one of the projects they did at a group. Intro page, here's the project. Here's all the people that worked on it. So he's not hiding the fact that it was group work. But then when we get to the actual parts about the, the, the project, he's emphasizing the things that he did or that he worked with, especially this part. He did a lot of the programming to do with this. So he spent a whole page talking about this process because that was what he was really involved with. And that's the key in group work is to emphasize the part that you're working on and that you're doing. 
Another example of student work here. I really like the typography in this one. I think it's, it's really well done. It's clean. And so we see there's a nice flow line that's established here. You can read that right in here, whatever that text is. That flow line stays consistent page to page. You guys see how that flips? There it is. It's right on top of itself here. Fonts are the same. Typography is the same. Even though this one, for example, has all the color background to it, there's still a certain vocabulary that's consistent page to page. There we are moving forward. Right? So here's a couple um, links. I'll put the links on the course website. Um, do spend some time looking at visualizing architecture. It's very much worth your time uh, to investigate that a little bit more. So we're going to take a quick break. Uh, let's come back at 9 or 8. See, apparently I'm screwed up on the time too, right? Uh, let's come back uh, at 8.55, and then I will uh, go through kind of laying out this multiple page document, page numbers, spreads, et cetera, OK? I already did your, huh? I already did it. No, but I'm going somewhere else. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, so we're going to give it a shot on the Mac now and see. If I can do it. Like I said, I hesitate to do this because things move slightly differently. Uh, the other subtle difference is that I have InDesign 2020 and this is InDesign 2019, so just subtle differences. But you'll get the same stuff uh, essentially. So let me try this again. I'm going to go into Create New. It's shocking, it works fast, no way. Uh, and I'm going to once again go into Landscape Mode. I'm going to check the box for facing pages here. Uh, down here under Margins, I'm going to adjust all of my margins to be a quarter of an inch, except I'll break it and adjust the inside margin to be a half of an inch. And then I'll continue down here under the um, bleed. We're going to set the bleed at an eighth of an inch, so 0.125, except for the inside, which I will set at zero, like that. So this was all that I just, same thing that I went through. Uh, and then I'll click the Create button. <laughs> Nice. It opened up. So um, now that I have the first page opened up, it's important to note which page is the first page. Okay. So if we imagine a stack of papers or a book, the first page is essentially the top. And then when I open the book is when I'll get page two and page three. So right now, if I look at my pages window, let me, uh, let me switch into the essentials so that it should match what you guys are seeing here. Um, by default, usually it's just properties that's showing. I'll go ahead and click over into the Pages tab. And when I'm in the Pages tab, I should see page one. And I don't have any more pages yet. I can create more pages by coming down here and clicking on the, the Add a New Page button. So I could click and click. That's going to give me page one, two, three. I could go further and say four, five. Now, the advantage here is that I can rearrange the pages if I want, and I can always add more pages. So it's not like I have to commit to, oh, this is going to be a 12-page document or something. I can just add pages when I need them. So this is showing me kind of an overview. If I want to jump between pages, I can double-click on a given page, and it will jump to that particular page. So I'm going to go back to page one here, like that. Let me close the characters here. Um, OK. So I have page one set up. We can see here on page one, let me press control zero so that I fill the page. We could see that my, my binding would be along this edge. There's no bleed along that binding. And then across the top, the right side, and the bottom here, I have that outermost red line. That's that bleed. So that would be the, the outermost extent of an image. Most of that is going to get cut off, an eighth of an it should get cut off, but it's there as backup as well. OK, so as I start to think about this particular page or this particular layout, um, I have a couple things to, to keep in mind. One, of course, I could just start on uh, a given spread. So let's say it was pages 2 and 3. Let me double click to get on pages 2 and 3. There's my spread right there. And I could just start working on the page itself. Um, 
as, as it went. So for example, I could draw a guide over and say, okay, I want that guide to fall you know, halfway on the page, right there, and then my text would go over here, and my image would go over there, et cetera. So I could just draw right on the page. Sometimes, however, you want to set up some, some elements that appear page after page, or maybe some guides that appear page after page. And that's where the concept of a master comes into play. And a master is essentially uh, content that would show up on every page. And so if we look at the pages window again, we have our standard pages, one, two, three, four, five. And then up above, I have something called an A master. I have none, and I have A master, and it shows a blank set of pages. If I were to double click on, say, the A master on either one of those pages, this is now what's called a master page. So any content that I put on this page, so to be silly here, I could put something like, hi. Any content I put on that page will then show up on every other page with this master applied to it. So I have, if I look at the page here, I see that little A in the upper corner. That represents the master that's been applied to it. It's the A master. So if I were to go to page one now, guess what? High is on page one. If I were to go to page three, high is on page three. Do you guys get how that works? Furthermore, I can't actually select or delete that content off the page when it's on, if it's applied on the master to these pages. So it's, it's, it's on the master only, and it repeats on the other pages. So there's a distinct advantage for this, for example, because you can set things up on the master that would appear page after page. So if, for example, I knew that I wanted there to be a flow line that was, say, down at one inch from the top, I could set up a guide for that one inch flow line. I'll do it here as well so it's on both pages like there and there. Let me press control zero so you can see it. There you go. You guys see that guide? Now that would appear on every one of these pages consistently in the same spot. So that could be helpful. The other thing I could do is I could say, let me go ahead and divide this so that I had that line that was in the middle. Say right there. I could take it one step further and put one of the guides over on this page at the halfway point, just to kind of divide up. So I'm setting up these guidelines to give myself an advantage when I move on to the pages themselves. Oh, there's my guidelines. Great. That's good. Let me go back up to my A master here. Now the other thing that I could put on this page is elements that would repeat. So for example, a page number would go on the page. Or let's say that I wanted a little line to appear in my title. So let's say that, um, go ahead and uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to use the line tool here, and I'm going to draw a line on this from right there to right there. I'll go to my properties, my stroke. It's at one point right now. That's good. OK, so that line now would appear on every one of the pages. So it would appear on page one, it would appear again on page three, it would appear again on page five. Does that make sense? So it's repeating. Now the one place that does get a little tricky, and that is that if I knew that I wanted some text here, I could, in the master, actually create the text. So I could say, okay, let's create a text box. And I have I would not normally be writing this much. I'm just using this as an example. Uh, and let me go in and just fill it with placeholder text so that you can see what it would look like there with some placeholder text in it. And I should probably give myself a title. Let me go into properties here. I'm going to align to the right. Um, let's do... Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to set up some, uh, some general fonts here. Let's jump this up to about 18. There we go. And let's drop this down. Okay, so let's say that I set up 
some, some text. Now, all of this was done on the master, which means that it applies on all of the pages themselves. The problem, though, is on any one of these pages, let's say I didn't want this to be that particular title, I can't select and change this text anymore. So text is the one thing that's not the best to have on your master. So what I would do is I would take it, I have it already laid out uh, on the master, I know how it goes and where it goes, etc. I would take the text, I would go up to my edit menu and I'd say copy, then I go ahead and delete it off the master, then I would go to the page itself and go to edit paste in place, which will put it in the same location on this page. Then I go to page three, for example, and I go to edit paste in place. There it is again. And then I go to page five and then I go to edit paste in place. So in this scenario, the text is in the same part, but I could change this to something else. Does that make sense? So keep the text off of the master unless, of course, it's a page number. So I have now individual text on any one of these pages. Now I'm not limited to having just one master. So I could say, you know, in this scenario, I have it laid out so that my text uh, and that little line, we can preview it to see it a little bit better. Let me go into view screen mode and let me go into preview mode so you can see it without the lines on it. Now I could say, okay, you know what? I, I like this on the right, but maybe on the pages two and three, I want it on the left. I could create a new master with the text on the other side of the page. So up here in the masters, if I were to right click, I can say uh, either duplicate master spread, or I could create a brand new master. I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate it. It's gonna be called the B master. Let me go back into my screen mode and go to normal so I can see all my guides. And then we'll move this over on this page. like that. And then down here on page two and three, I can change the master. So it's got the A in the upper left and right corners. If I select those two pages and I right click, I can say um, apply master to pages. And now instead of the A master, I want it to be the B master. And so it's going to use the other set of pages. Does that kind of make sense? You can on, yeah. So what I just up in the master section here, I just right click and it's either a new master or to duplicate the, the existing master. So on the masters themselves, I can also add frames. So I could go into my frame tool and I could say, okay, let's put a, I want one big image that goes all the way right there. And on this B master, I want another big image that's going the opposite direction. Like that. And then we can see that appear on the various masters. So here we are on page four and five. There's that frame. Pages two and three. Oh, I didn't move the text over. Let me take the text and move that. go uh, and I would need to adjust the so it's over on the right there we go now if I wanted to place an image into that on the page itself so remember up on the masters I'm not going to place the images it's only down on the pages themselves that I would place the image so there's pages two and three if I wanted to put the image there I would go to file and then place and then I would drop whatever the image is there, let's see here. Let's see if I can find something here. Mm. So I go to file and then place. Now all I have to do is click over the top of that frame and it will make it the size of that frame. Let me right click and go to fitting and then we'll fill frame proportionally so we can see the overall piece and then I can press control minus so you can see it. Um, let me zoom out here and you can see the overall setup of that particular spread. Now down here 
on this one, I can do the same thing with content on this. So I'd go to file and then uh, place. And let's pick a different one here. And once it's loaded up, I can, again, just click over the top of the frame and it will fill to that frame's size. I'll right click and go to fitting and then we'll fill frame proportionally and there it is there as well. So you guys get kind of how that works? So I can use the frames if I want on the master. Of course, on any one of these pages, I could just draw it as well. And That's the other option. To, to click outside of the paper? The what? The frame for the picture, you did it outside, right? Uh, I, I had drawn the frame on the master here. Yeah, but you went outside the page. Right? So I go outside of the page, that's the bleed. Right. I go all the way outside so that if I were to do this and then cut it, I'd have extra space on the side so that I'd for sure get everything. Okay. That's why I had those go all the way. Does that kind of make sense so far? Now what happens if I want to put a page number on a given page? Now a page number is, there's a couple ways of doing it. Obviously you could just manually put a page number on the page, but if I were to rearrange the pages, if I were to say, you know what, I really want pages four and five in front of pages two and three, if I set up the page numbers to know what page it is, it makes life a lot easier because I can rearrange the pages and the page numbers change with it. So I'm going to set up the page number on the master. I'm going to go to the A master. Let me zoom in here. I'm going to put the page number in the lower right corner. There we go. And so I'll create a text box for the page number. We'll put it right there. I have to adjust my properties and, and that sort of thing. And let's make this a little bit bigger here. Okay. And so the page number, obviously, I could put in like a, you know, a one or, or something like that. Okay. But instead of doing that on the master, I'm going to go up to the type menu and I'm going to go to insert special character, markers, and then current page number. So insert type, insert special character, markers, current page number. And when I do that, it's going to show up as an A here because I'm on the A master. However, when I go to my individual pages, so there's page one, that is going to be replaced with page one. If I go down here to page five, it's now going to be replaced with a five. The styling of it works the same. I just go to my master and I set up my styling however I want. If I wanted it, say for example, justified to the right or whatever that then corresponds to every individual page. So there it is on page five, there's page five. Now here's the advantage. So if I took pages four and five and I said, you know what, I want them to happen before pages two and three, there it is. This, what was page five, is now renumbered to be page three. So as you shuffle the pages around, you can end up um, renumbering the pages as you go, which I think is a big advantage. The other thing that you can do relating to this and this is kind of a more advanced topic because it, it generally has to do with when you have a book or something with chapters in it and you want to be able to identify chapters. Um, you can create more than just page numbers. So for example, I could call this um, pages two and three a particular project name. So this was the, what was it, the mountain house. I'm just making this stuff up as I go. Uh, I could say that this right here, page two and three, this starts a section. And so I'm going to write down, I'm going to right click on the pages and I'm going to go to numbering and section options. I'm going to start a section here. I'm going to start my page numbering at, if I wanted to have it start at a specific number instead of the, the automatic numbering, I'll leave it as automatic. I could also change the style of the page number. So instead of having uh, numbers, I could have you know, Roman numerals or, or whatever, a different style of page number here. And then under section marker, I could say, you know what, this is the mountain house. Like that. So I now have a marker for mountain house, and I can go ahead and say, okay. I get a little triangle that appears above this page, because that's when the um, section starts. Now, if I go back up to my master, 
and here under page number I can go to type insert special character and I can say markers section marker and when I do that it's gonna put a little section marker in there uh, I need a little bit more text for this and maybe I want to put a little bracket or something like that so now when I go to page 3 it's going to replace the section with the the uh, the text of that particular section it's still not big enough for um, the text so let me switch that there we go and now you're gonna see it with that section marker now if I move on let's let me just duplicate these pages There we go. So it's the same. It's the same page, but now we're down here on uh, page seven. If I change this and I say this is no longer the mountain house, it's going to be the uh, something else. I can right click and I can say numbering and section options. And down here I can say I want a section marker here of uh, I don't know. Let's call it the beach house instead. And I'll say okay. That's going to be updated to be the beach house because it's now the beach house section versus the mountain house section. So it's not necessarily relevant for a portfolio because you can, you can do this stuff without using it. I just like to introduce the concept because it is something that's built in InDesign that lets you do these section markers, etc. Okay, so that's page numbers. That is section markers. Um, I think we've covered a lot of what we're after uh, today. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. When it comes to output for today, I'm going to ask that you export one spread. So let me press Control-0 and then Control-minus here to zoom out a little bit. There we go. So you're going to export one spread. I'll go to File and then Export. We're going to export as a JPEG. And I'll just put it, uh, let's see here. Like that. Now, when I go to do it, I'm going to choose that I want a spread to be exported, and I'm going to be exporting uh, a range, and I'm going to say I want pages six to seven. Okay. Then my quality will be maximum. My resolution will be 300. I already have spreads checked, and I'll go ahead and click on export and it'll export that whole thing all the way across. So I'll see the whole, the whole piece. Okay? So I'm going to let you guys get started. I have all the portfolios in the back for you to look at to try to get inspired. So spend some time back there, work on it. You have two things to put in your portfolio so far. You have your assignment 101 and your assignment 102. Some of you have posters from 121 that you could put in. Some of you have other projects that you've done. Maybe you have a project that you did in 120 that you liked. Feel free to put and include any and all of those projects in here as well. So the only thing that's required for assignment 107 is all of the assignments from this class. It'll be 101 through 106. You'll have all of those included. And then anything on top of that that you want to include, I would encourage you to do it. Long term, I have every understanding that you're going to get rid of the stuff from this class out of your portfolio. That's okay. But if you put the other content in, your portfolio will be that much further ahead being ready. So go ahead and try to put that other content in as well. Okay? So I'll let you guys start. I apologize that my computer was acting up today, such as life. If there are subtle differences between the Mac and, um, and the, the Windows version, I apologize for that as well. On the page number, when mm -hmm. I tried to follow along, I just got it on one page. So how do you get it to be... So you want the page numbers to be applied up on the master. Right. So you want to be on the master. And then when you insert, say, um, so I have one on the, the right side here. Uh -huh. And I went up to type, insert special character, uh, markers, 
current page number, right. and that shows up there. Then when I go to the um, actual page, it's going to show up there. It's going to show up there. It's not showing up on, it's not on the left because I didn't put it on the left. If I want it to be on the left, I would need to come over to the A master. I would need to put the text, I'm going to do it outside here for just a second. I would go to um, uh, type, special character, insert, marker, pair, current page number, there it is. I would have to go through and do my properties selection here. So this was uh, justified to the right. And I'm going to change this because I know it's on top of an image. I'm going to change that page number to be white. And then I can move this over so that it shows up there. Now, when I go to my pages, if I go to page two, oh, it's behind. I have to put it on front. So this actually brings up a good point. I should, um, I should point this out. So in this case, I put a page number on this page. Um, but it's showing up behind when I go to the page itself, either page six or page two, it's showing up behind the actual image. So this, in this scenario, one of the, the strategies would be to take that object and put it on its own layer. So let me go to my layers. I'm going to create a new layer. I will put that object onto layer two, like that. And now layer two is on top of everything else, which means when I go to page two, that page number is going to be on top of everything else. So I'm using the layer to determine where it is in the stack. Um, likewise, that page number would show up again right there as page six. But I manually have to put the page number on both sides of the page in the master for them to show up on all the pages. Okay. Okay? Likewise, if I went to page four and five right now, there are no page numbers on page four and five because those have the B master applied to them. And I would have to apply, uh, I would have to put the page numbers on the B master in addition to the A master. It can be pretty easy because I could go to the A master, I could take my two um, pieces, so those two, I could go to edit, copy, I could jump to my B master, and I could go to edit, paste in place, which would give me both of those. The colors would have to be reversed though, so this one would have to be black. And the one that's over here would probably need to be white. There we go. And so now those are applied. And if I went to pages four and five, there would be the pieces. Oh, same thing. I have to adjust the layers. So let me make sure that this and this are up on the layer two. And now let me try that again. There we go. So that would be showing up. So I have to put it on that master in addition. So the, for, for the page numbers to work, they would have to be on every master that you're using. OK? If we go to the top menu, where can we find layers on the like, uh, five? If you, yeah, if the layers aren't showing, if you go to Window, okay. you'll be able to choose layers from, from within okay. Window. OK, I'll let you guys start working. Let me know if you have any questions. Do spend some time back there with the portfolios, though, today. And so having the, the margin in the center of two pages does not affect an image at all? It would just affect text? Yeah, the image would span all the way across. Actually, technically, text would span all the way across, too. But if you imagine the binding going through, you'd lose the text. Right. So it's, it, in this scenario, the binding would go right through this part of the image. So you'd be losing part of the image with all the little holes. It would probably be OK because of the rest of the image is still shown. But if you, if you look at some of the ones in the back, it helps kind of illustrate, oh, that would be what it would look like. So I might choose not to have this go all the way across. It just It's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. Or what would happen if you didn't have the center? Hold on one second.